In early 2001, two marine engineers, Pauline Selinsky and her husband Paul Weinswig, conducted an exploration and survey mission at a location off the Pinar del Rio province of the western coast of Cuba. They were performing sonar surveys commissioned by the Cuban government in order to locate shipwrecks dating back to the Spanish colonial era. They were utilizing the sonar at a depth of about 2,000 feet when they received perplexing images that defied logic. The sonar images indicating large structures resembling pyramids, massive blocks, and mysterious circular structures contrasted against an otherwise flat seafloor. The team was uncertain at the time what they were observing, but they were certain this was no shipwreck. Returning to the site in July 2001 with geologist Manuel Interalde, senior researcher of Cuba's Natural History Museum, the team utilized a remote-controlled sonar submersible vehicle to examine and film the structures. The images revealed large blocks of stone resembling hewn granite, measuring about 8 feet by 10 feet. Some blocks appeared deliberately stacked on top of one another, others appeared isolated from the rest. Even Interalde conceded that it was a cool discovery but pointed out that the ruins were too deep to have possibly been man-made, in his opinion, as he estimated that it would have taken around 50,000 years for such a city to have sunk that low into the sea, putting it past the technology that would have been available at the time. He stated, quote, 50,000 years ago, there wasn't the architectural capacity in any of the cultures we know of to build complex buildings. It would be cool if they were right, but it would be really advanced for anything we would see in the New World for that time frame. The structures are out of place and out of time." End quote. The discovery made huge news at the time, with sensational headlines declaring that an underwater lost civilization had been found off the Cuban coast. Almost simultaneously, theories emerged associating the site with the legendary lost continent of Atlantis, UFOs, and of course, ancient aliens. However, Zelensky and Weinsweg were unwilling to make such comparisons. Quote, what we have found is more likely remnants of a local culture, once located on a 100-mile land bridge that joined Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula with Cuba. Interalde added that there are local legends of the Maya and native Yacatecos that tell of an island inhabited by their ancestors that vanished beneath the waves. Nevertheless, Interalde does not discount the possibility that the rock formations are merely the result of the wonders of Mother Nature. Nature is able to create some really unimaginable structures, he said. The discovery caught the attention of more than just the public. For what appears to be a brief time, the Cuban and American governments, certain academic and scientific specialists and publications like National Geographic were admitting that the structures were indeed anomalous. But as our viewers are well aware, the predictable protocols of the mainstream soon followed the initial reaction. Although they really had no explanation at all, they almost immediately denied that this was some sort of lost city made by humans or aliens for that matter. Even though diligent scientists were of the mindset that more data was needed to derive a conclusion at all about what was shown in the images, and rightfully so, mainstream took over their debunking efforts. Of course, the archive always likes to point out the debunkers because history tends to prove them so wrong. According to Keith Fitzpatrick Matthews of the site Bad Archaeology, quote, The depth of the alleged remains is the biggest problem of all. During the Pleistocene, sea levels dropped as water was locked up in the ice sheets that developed around the globe. Well, they did not develop around the globe, they developed on the polar axis. At the maximum extent of the ice, the drop in level was around 100 meters which is very different from the 600 to 750 meters depth of the alleged remains. At no point during the Ice Age would they have been above sea level unless, of course, the land on which they stand has sunk." End quote. So, let us take this statement on its face. 
First, he states these are alleged remains. Yet, here he is talking about and posting about something merely alleged. In case you didn't know already, the use of the word alleged in this context is debunking 101. Alleged or not, the truth is there's compelling scientific evidence of structures, and it is why he tries to distract from the discovery. He then, without explanation, narrows the time span of his analysis down to the Pleistocene era, which was between about 2.6 million to 12,000 years ago. He describes the geological metrics of the time period and concludes that, quote, at no point during the Ice Age would they have been above sea level unless, of course, the land on which they stand has sunk, end quote. While this may be an accurate statement in and of itself, it does not rule out the Holocene era. In other words, the construction and subsequent destruction of this sunken city could obviously be mutually exclusive of just the Pleistocene era. Fitzpatrick Matthews, having arbitrarily narrowed down the only alternative to one of the land sinking under the sea, then states, quote, This is the claim made for Atlantis. According to Plato's account, the only primary source for it, it was destroyed by violent earthquakes and floods. However, if we take Plato at his word, and we must if we assume Atlantis to have been a historical place, the violence of its sinking makes it improbable that an entire city could have survived plunging more than 600 meters into an abyss. Rapid sinking would devastate structures. The persistence of mud just below the surface suggests that the sinking was not to a depth of 600 to 740 meters. Unless we are prepared to jettison Plato's text, the sole source for the story of Atlantis, we cannot identify the features found by Paulina Selinsky with Atlantis, end quote. So, this is interesting. Here, Fitzpatrick Matthews creates a false equivalency. Basically, he is saying this cannot be Atlantis because of how violently Atlantis ended. Well, in case this guy did not bother to notice, for their part, Selinsky and Weinsweg maintained that they believed it to be the remnants of a city that had been built by local peoples upon a land bridge connecting Cuba to the mainland at some point. They never ascribed to the Atlantis theory and in fact rebuked it as we alluded to earlier. Of course, there have been other theories posited, such as the city was intentionally built underwater or even that it was created by ancient aliens. Another, more mundane theory is that these are simply anomalous natural structures. Fitzpatrick Matthews concludes by applying one of mainstream's favorite discrediting tactics, and that is calling into question the methodology and research equipment. In this case, it is the sonar equipment used to generate the images. He states, quote, The next problem involves trying to understand what the sonar shows. All the fancy graphics showing pyramid-like structures are computer-generated. They are not photographs of things seen under the sea. All the detail is limited to the resolution of the side-scan sonar, which is not good enough to determine whether the supposed structures exhibit 90-degree angles, let alone confirm the claims that some stones are covered in hieroglyphs. The initial images, which do not have the three-dimensional data provided by the side-scanning sonar, show rectilinear but not rigorously right-angled features. So, I suspect that the angularity of the generated images is an artifact of the processing, much like many of the details claimed for the face on Mars. We have some interesting sonar images that are basically like ink blot tests. They need interpreting, and the interpretation is entirely dependent upon the preconceptions and biases of those looking at them. Paulina Selinsky was predisposed to see artificiality because that is what she was being paid to do, even if the artificiality she was specifically interested in was sunken ships. Wow. So there is a lot to unpack in this final statement. First, Fitzpatrick Matthews feels a need to discredit the sonar technology when it helps make his point 
but in fact, side scan sonar is accurate. Check this out from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. Quote, Side scan radar is a category of active sonar system for detecting and imaging objects on the seafloor. The multiple physical sensors of the sonar, called a transducer array, send and receive the acoustic pulses that help map the seafloor or detect other objects. This array can be mounted on the ship's hull or placed on another platform like a towfish. As the ship moves along its path, the transducer array sends out signals on both of its sides, sweeping the seafloor like the fan-shaped beam of a flashlight. Side scans search at a constant speed and in straight lines, allowing the ship to map the ocean bottom as it travels. The towfish will record data at different sound frequencies depending on the survey goals. A lower frequency between 50 kHz and 100 kHz can cover large swaths of the seafloor at low image resolution. Higher frequency pulses between 500 kHz and 1 MHz record smaller areas but in much greater detail. The resulting picture from side scan sonar data is made up of dark and light areas. Hard objects protruding from the bottom send a strong echo and create a dark image. Shadows and soft areas such as mud and sand send weaker echoes and create light areas. These dark and light images help scientists create accurate maps of the seafloor. As a specialized sonar system, side scan has particular benefits. This system is often used to map cultural heritage sites like shipwrecks to characterize the makeup of the seafloor and can even be used to help biologists identify habitats of marine animals." End quote. So, while Fitzpatrick Matthews feels that side sonar technology produces nothing more than fancy computer-generated graphics, most of his mainstream colleagues, and even NOAA, utilize it as an integral part of undersea research. So, either these scientists are relying on inaccurate images, or Fitzpatrick Matthews is demonstrating an unjustified bias. Finally, we come to what may be the most desperate part of his attempted debunking effort. Out of the blue, he brings up the face on Mars and a wholly separate issue of process artifacting. The real reason he is injecting this non sequitur is so that he could take at least one last swipe at Zelensky. He essentially is accusing her of pareidolia which is defined as the tendency for perception to impose a meaningful interpretation on a nebulous stimulus, usually visual, so that one sees an object, pattern, or meaning where there is none. So, according to Fitzpatrick Matthews, not only is the equipment inaccurate, but the images are being misinterpreted by the researcher according to her own preconceptions. The Archive's opinion at this point is that it is Fitzpatrick Matthews himself that is the one with the preconceptions. And that is no surprise, because a debunker regularly has to inject logical fallacies and personal opinion when accusing someone else of those very things. The Archive does not purport to have the answers about these sunken structures, but we do recognize an academic debunking hit job when we see it. And it was probably because of these types of mainstream analyses that there have been no real follow-up expeditions to the site. A more suspicious reason that has been proposed for no follow-up at the location is that the Cuban government has initiated a cover-up and chased people away from the area, including the original crew that discovered it. The good news is that regardless of whether it is an unexplained ancient civilization or a simple geological formation, the knowledge of its existence is in the public forum now. And eventually, one day, someone can return there and discover the truth.